This is The Dental Marketer, the podcast where we teach you how to effectively market and grow your dental practice. My name is Michael Arias, and my mission is to help you, the practice owner, attract new patients immediately and effectively market and grow your business so you can become the go-to dental practice in your community. All right, I want you to picture this. You're in Dr. Connor Perrin's shoes, and you're diving into the world of dentistry with a dream in your pocket. But then you're hit with a real head scratcher. How do you kickstart your own practice without tossing your values aside? How do you get real with your patients and make them feel seen and heard? And here's the kicker. How do you get your name out there and compete with the big dogs, the DSOs, and the practices that's been there for decades and years in your community? The old timers. We're getting down to the nitty gritty of these dilemmas today with Dr. Perrin himself. And here's a sneak peek of what's coming. Connor tells us how to stay true to your vision, uh, the game-changing power of asking the right questions, and the hustle it takes to start profiting. And if you're eyeing those patients that need high-end work, we're uncovering the branding secrets that scream quality over discounts. But the real deal, it's all about connecting with your patients on a deeper level. Whether you're a seasoned practice owner looking for a fresh take, or you're about to become a practice owner right now who has big dreams. I want you to listen in to Dr. Connor Perrin's insights for help in your journey. So all that coming up on The Dental Marketer. And if you're caught in the relentless juggling act of managing a dental practice, I mean, you're juggling and you're dealing with insurance claims, appointments, patient data, clinical notes, security, all this, and it's just overwhelming you. Is that happening? Be prepared to discover the game-changing solution that could end your scheduling nightmares, fortify your patient data, and provide real-time insights, and something that handles insurance billings and claims, all while evolving to meet your future needs. I'll let you know about this at the end of this episode. But for now, let's talk with Dr. Connor Perrin. All right, it's time to talk with our featured guest, Dr. Connor Perrin, or Perron. How's it going, man? (laughs) Are you going? Did I say it? Okay or no? Technically, yeah. If you're saying the French way, it is Pearl, but I'd uh, very way just Perrin. Nice. Have you ever been to France? Is that where your family's from? I uh, did a trip once a couple of years back to Paris and then uh, south of France. Beautiful. Oh, man. Yeah. That's a spot out there, yeah. right? South of France. Awesome, man. So tell us a little bit about where you came from, your past, your present. What are you doing right now? So right now I'm at my personal office right now. We just opened a book a couple months ago, but I was born and raised in Orange County. And I went to school at USC, but for undergrad at Dell School, finished up there and then stayed in LA for a couple of years after I finished up. And I knew that I always wanted to come back down this way. It's just always been home to me. When I got started with this process, I looked around in Newport Beach, Irvine, and decided upon this building. I felt like it was in a very easy to access area for a lot of people from different parts of Orange County. And yeah, the entire build out, getting the loan set up process wise probably took a little bit over a year. So it's actually decently quick considering I've heard some people take sometimes multiple years. But yeah, and then I've been associating part time and now I'm officially in my own practice full time five days a week as of this week. Nice, man. So rewind a little bit. Why did you decide to do a startup? So for me, I was actually not originally think that I was going to do a startup. I had a couple of friends who recommended one, but I was thinking, you know, I might want to just go and buy a practice because it might be a little bit easier to deal with. But there were a couple of things that I noticed when I was looking around. I didn't have a ton of connections with people who were close to getting ready to sell. And so I feel like a lot of sales that did happen tended to be passed around by word of mouth. Sometimes they wouldn't be listed. And I think maybe just because I am on the younger side, when I was asking, you know, some of these brokers for information about potential listings, I feel like they maybe didn't take me seriously. I was looking around a little bit more and so many of the practices that I did see, I wanted to change so much of the way that they practice dentistry and maybe the interiors, the equipment that they had. And it made me think, I'm going to spend so much money wanting to redo this immediately when I get it. Why not just start from scratch and have everything in my vision from day one? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you were looking for acquisitions at the beginning. I was, yes. But to find like a good one, it can be tough to find it if you don't really have... I personally have not really had a true mentor. So I haven't been able to use that to leapfrog to find a potential acquisition. Gotcha. Okay. You mentioned they didn't take you seriously because of maybe they saw you like you were on the younger side and stuff like that. How'd you know? How'd you know they weren't taking you seriously? 
for example, I would see a practice that I thought I was interested in and immediately I would reach out and they would text me and just be like, yeah, sure, sure, sure. And I would want to set up a time immediately to meet either the head doctor or to check out the office. And then I would get ghosted. And then about a week later, they're like, oh, were you still interested in seeing the practice? And I'm just like, oh, I'm so sorry. Were your first choices rejecting it? And now you're trying to come back to me. <laughs> I very much felt that impression from at least yeah. for, for people. And I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, you're like, I'm your, I'm your second option. Yeah, yeah you exactly. Yeah. You know, and so again, I think it is because they just forgot the year that I graduated and they probably thought that I wasn't truly serious about wanting to take that step into ownership. What year did you graduate? 21. Oh, 21. Oh, okay, man. So you're like, you said, I'm going to do this. I'm yeah, I know. Exactly. This. Yeah. I just, I can be, I guess, not picky. That's the wrong word, but I just say, uh, I like to practice the way exactly I want to practice. I think it's very important to associate. You learn a ton of stuff. You pick up your speed, efficiency, how to talk to people, most importantly. But I just really wanted to be able to do everything the way that I wanted to rather than the owner. So then how exactly do you want to practice? You know, there's like so many different ways that you can practice dentistry. But for me, I really value deeper personal relationships and being able to spend a lot of individual time with each of my patients. I don't want to feel like also I'm having to hop between a lot of different rooms. So when I book a patient here, I tell them they're going to be here for X amount of time. And that's going to be completely undisturbed attention between me and them where I am treating them. I'm also really big on conservative dentistry. So I try not to treat and play any crowns unless I'm replacing a current one that might be defective. And I'm really big on adhesive dentistry. Gotcha, gotcha. So building that relationship with the patient. And then obviously the clinical side is what you oh. wanted to. How'd you figure that out? What bad stuff were you experiencing? Like, I guess, in corporate or other stuff where you're like, I never want to do this. And then some yeah, things I, where you're like, I could take this into my own practice. We were very fortunate. At USC, we got taught by Dr. Pascal Monnier and he is really big on biomimetic dentistry, very minimally invasive, conservative, adhesive-based dentistry. So that's the way that me and my classmates all learned from the get-go. You took that for granted because then when you graduate, it's not like that at all in any offices. You're doing a lot of crown work. You're not really using a lot of the nice bonding materials that you're used to when we were at USC. And so when I hopped into my first position, I started to see a lot of things like more post-op sensitivity, maybe restorations not lasting as long as they should. And I also... I mean, everyone's very different, but I really don't like hopping around from chair to chair. It doesn't allow me to really be present with each person. And that's something when I was in that first position that I did not like. Gotcha. Okay. So that carried out and you're like, I'm not going to ever do that in my practice. What were some of the things you decided you you took away from other, you know what I mean? Like associates, and you're like, I'm going to do this. Definitely systems. For example, they would contact patients when it would come to confirming their appointments, different things that they wanted me, I guess, to say during an exam that would cause a patient to ask, prompt them to be more open-ended rather than just giving me a yes or a no answer. So a lot of little things like that. And then also I worked in offices that were more insurance-based and then some offices that were, you know, just fill another half of the patients. So technically they were fee for service. And in seeing the differences between the two, it made me realize I wanted to be fee for service and just fill on behalf of the patient. So right now you're not with any insurance. Not, which is terrifying. You know, like the first week I saw friends and family and then I realized, oh no, I have like no people on my schedule. And immediately I'm just like, I made a huge mistake. I have a consultant and so I'm talking through, I'm just like, oh, I shouldn't have done this. Give me all the information on someone to get credential. And I also have another kind of scary phone call with a friend of a friend and he's just like, oh, you're making a huge mistake. You should definitely get credential. But, you know, after having, you know, a couple mild panic attacks that first week, I realized this is not what I want to do. It's not true to my vision. This is not how I built this office. And unfortunately, just by advertising, mailers seem to be working a little bit of, you know, direct person to person interaction and Instagram stuff. I started to get a couple of people to come through the door and seeing just a few people and having them pay out of pocket. You're still able to do just as well as you could be if you're seeing quite a few more patients and taking insurance and you're able to practice the way you want to and spend individual attention with them. I get different ways to practice, but I definitely realized Stay true to the way you wanted to do it. You're going to be happier that way. Yeah. How many weeks or months have you been open? Today or actually yesterday is officially three months. Okay, man. Um, do you think you're going to eventually hit that where you're like, okay, I'm panicking again. I should probably get credentialed. I'm very lucky to have 
two other friends who are kind of in their startup journeys and they're right around the year mark. There's definitely ups and downs with months. July and August are really good. I feel like this month we're maybe not doing quite as well as those two months, but everything is slowly on an upward trend like that. And there's still not a day that goes by right now where I'm just like, hey, I took out this monster loan. Maybe I shouldn't have spent this much money to do all this stuff. I have a huge debt service at the end of the month, but it's natural. I was able to get my tenant improvement check for my landlord recently. And so that's able to help pay some of the bills right now until things stabilize a little bit more so. Okay, gotcha, man. I've talked with a lot of people who are like, yeah, I eventually had to get credential. And then eventually they try to phase it out. I don't know how easy it is to phase it out. You know what I mean? Because then they have to deal with, I'm losing half my patients type of deal. You know what I mean? Yeah. And the other thing is too, since you are a startup, I mean, realistically, rarely do they ask, are you in network? I think we've gotten only one of those type of phone calls. Usually they will ask, do you take insurance? And I mean, the answer still is technically yes. We are very happy to build, but we explained that we still require upfront payment. They will get reimbursed by their insurance company via a check in around two to three weeks. And as long as you explain things very clearly to each patient, they usually actually don't have a problem with that. Gotcha. So it's communication. Exactly. Right? Gotcha. Something you mentioned a little bit before I want to rewind, you said you learned some things that you would say to patients that would give them an open answer instead of like a yes or no. What were some of those things? When I'm starting out with the consultation, one of the things that I always like to ask the patient is what brought you here? And to tell me a little bit more about yourself, your journey, et cetera, rather than just, did you have braces? Do you have popping or clicking? You know, immediately just yes, no, yes, no. I want them to open up more so. And that definitely carries it out into like a cosmetic consultation more so because you want to really connect with the patient and try to get their emotions to say yes to what you're trying to offer them essentially because you want to ask them like, oh, how will this make you feel? Or what are some of the things that you're wanting to get out of treatment that have brought you here? And so the more that they're starting to think about it, the more they almost realize, okay, I really want to have this done. Gotcha. How long is your new patient visits, your first visit? If the patient is really easy, they're quick and they don't talk a lot, I can have them in and out of here in about an hour and 20 minutes if they've not had a cleaning or if they're not doing a cleaning. Standard though, without a cleaning is an hour and a half. If we get the cleaning in there and the patient's willing to stay, then maybe like two hours, two hours, 10 minutes. Okay. Will it ever like go lower, less or anything as you get busier? Or are you like, no, I like that two hour mark. I like it quite frankly, because I take a lot of like DSLR photos and I like to use them to talk to the patient about what I'm seeing. So by the time that I upload them into the computer, crop them, upload them into Oryx, my assistant takes the x-ray, the scan, I'm like going as quickly as I can. I don't foresee it getting a little bit shorter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But the patient, how do they feel? Usually they don't have an issue with the length. Sometimes they will have wanted to clean, but by the time that we're done, they go ahead and postpone the cleaning for like a week or two afterwards. And we'll usually attach a little bit of treatment onto that cleaning appointment. Okay, gotcha. Because they're having to come back anyway. Yeah, I think mean, that makes sense. That's nice though, man. The, you know what I mean? Like you're doing all that, the work behind it. You know yeah. what I mean? To make oh, sure. Yeah. Thank you. And I, I feel like taking better photos with the patient, you know, intraoral and then also some portrait photography in case they do want to do aesthetic work or you're using it to communicate with Invisalign or a ceramist. I think the patient really sees the value in a lot of that. And again, when they see a very clear photo right in front of them, because we have a monitor right in front of our consultation room, it becomes a lot more real to them rather than you just putting an instrument in there being like, oh, I feel like a stick right there. Yeah, that does feel a lot better. So then yeah. let's dive into a little bit about your build out process and your business here. First and foremost, who'd you go with for your loan? Bank of America. Why'd you pick them? Oddly enough, they were the first bank that I talked to. I was talking to another bank that I have a good relationship with, but they don't really do a lot of dental specific stuff. And so I wanted to go with one that had a dental specific component. I know Wells Fargo used to, I don't think they do currently, but then another good one is Provide. But I talked to Ali, great guy. He's in charge, I think, of all the startup dental loans with Bank of America. And when I looked at what the interest rates were and how the repayment is done, it seemed like a really, really good offer. And that's what I ended up deciding to go with. Gotcha. Okay. And then how much was the loan for? So regarding loans, they'll kind of give you a different amount based off of what you're trying to do. I started off with 600 and then I don't know if I'm supposed to be saying this or not, but then when the project went over budget, then I asked for a little bit more and I got a little bit more. They able to give you a little bit more? Yeah. How? Just later on when the project was close to completion, I'm just like, we need to up this <laughs> a little bit. And 
they were very flexible with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you went over budget pretty quick or not that quick? Reasonably quick. Yeah. I was going to say, especially post COVID, it seems like construction costs have gone through the roof. I was talking to my contractor about that. Mm-hmm. Everything costs more. So that's why I feel like a lot of banks now, they usually have a hard cut, but then further on, if you need a little bit more, sometimes they will be generous. It'd be willing to give you a little bit extra. Gotcha. Okay. So then how much was your build out? It was like close to a million. Really? Yeah. Me uh-huh. here. I put every amount of personal money that I had into this thing. I maxed out everything that I could with the bank. I'm still in the process of paying my dad back for, you know, a little bit that he loaned to me. I'm not the type of person who's going to want to clock for a place similar to the way that I want to treat patients, but I don't want to move from office to office and continually try to go on to the next thing. I wanted this to be my life practice. And so I didn't want to cut any corners with trying to not do a certain thing or the other. I, I wanted everything to be good from the get go. So I wouldn't have to change it. Okay. So then touching around a million, what type yeah. of practice do you have? How many ops? It's still not complete technically. Two of the ops, they don't have shares or anything like that in them or like monitors. So we have a consultation room. I'm able to do Invisalign type stuff in there also. And then we have, if it were to be completely built out, try other ops. Okay. So um, then working right now, how many uh, that you're in? Including the consultation room, it would be four. And then the type of practice you have, it's fee-for-service general, or are you, oh no, we want to just focus on families or only cosmetics or... Fee-for-service general. And so like my overall goal is, obviously this is going to be general practice. I want to have a lot of people just coming in for routine dental care. But I eventually want to get to the position where I'm just doing cosmetic cases. And then I have maybe an associate working under me who's doing a lot of the other bread and butter type general dentistry. And then maybe like two hygienists. Mm -hmm. Because you're located where? I'm in Irvine. So I'm like close to the Irvine spectrum, about 15 minutes from Newport Beach, 10 minutes from Laguna Beach. Oh, that's yeah. right. That's so right. So I like did. a good eater for a lot of different areas. So whenever somebody signs up to the, the ground marketing course, I do like a little community research. And I was like, Irvine Spectrum has yeah. so much around there. Yeah. The Irvine company has built a ton of housing around here. I think they have something called the Great Park where they're putting in still a ton of other houses. And yeah, it's a good area to be in. So you guys got a lot. Yeah. Okay. So then do you ever plan to say like, oh, you know, I have one here, maybe one in Manhattan Beach or one Uh like, you know what I mean? Would be nice. I think so. I haven't put a lot of thought into it or if it would be reasonably nearby or maybe if I would even consider putting it in like a different state too. But yeah, I think that would be something I would definitely want to revisit maybe eight or so years after this is fully developed. Because, you know, I heard it could take almost six to seven years for your startup to reach the full size of a normal operating office. Gotcha. Okay. So then this kind of, but technically isn't like the end goal, right? No, but I don't want to just sell this off or leave this office. I will always want to have this office, at least as part of a brand potentially. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. And then how many employees do you have right now? So right now I have two. I have Katie. She's like our front desk concierge. She'll help patients out with insurance, checking them in, calling, scheduling, you name it. And then I have Jasmine. She's my assistant in the back. But one of the great things about Jasmine is she's also front office trained and Katie had no dental experience. So the first couple of weeks when Katie was trying to learn stuff, she was able to pick Jasmine's brain and Jasmine was able to fill in kind of the gaps there. Uh How'd you find them? Not easy. I was going to say I looked around a lot and I happened to find both of them on Indeed, I want to say. But even a lot of people on Indeed, people who reach out to you. And you'll go to schedule an interview with them. They look promising. And then all of a sudden they'll ghost you. I have a theory that a lot of it has to do with maybe them potentially wanting to collect unemployment. And so they want to show mm-hmm. proof that they've been looking for a job. But that's a different story. Oh, <laughs> but I happen to find both of them on Indeed. Gotcha. Okay. How do you craft your ad on Indeed? What do you ask for? I wrote it completely myself. I think I put the philosophy of my practice and how I'm going to be different than your standard dental office there. One of the things I really pointed out was I'm not really hiring so much on skill. I'm really hiring on personality because I feel like skill can always be taught and it can be trained, but you cannot change a person's personality, obviously. One of the things that really struck out is they had really nice smiles. They were very personable, bubbly, and I'm just like, this is great. We can work with this. Nice, man. I like that. What is the philosophy of your practice? So my philosophy is one-on-one personalized attention and just elevating a person's overall experience when they come in here. I'm not trying to sell a patient anything. I'm just trying to provide what they need and also do it in as minimally invasive of a way as possible. 
Gotcha. So then you've been up and running for three months now. Yes. What's production and collections looking like? I was going to say, uh, I haven't looked at August's data quite yet, but I think June was the wash. I was also on vacation the last month of June. It couldn't have been worse timing. But I think in July, we did almost 40,000 in collection. Okay. And then your break even point is where? Not playing myself. And this is a scary number. It's around 26,000. Okay. Paying yourself how much? If I'm giving myself not a great salary, bare bones, let's just say like in 30. Okay. No, yeah. No. I get because I can, I can live with that. I haven't paid myself at all so far. I just know that it's going to be a little short term gain for long term gain. So mm-hmm. I have to put it back to the business. Gotcha. And then how many days are you open? No, officially open five days a week. And we are open Monday through Thursdays from eight to four and then Fridays from seven to three. Okay. Did you create those hours because you saw that there was a need for that time or? No, I'm really big on a routine. I like being able to come home. And I mean, this is also stressful. Dentistry itself is stressful. So I need a personal life when I'm done at the end of the day. I've been in a couple offices where I did like a 10 to seven o'clock. And you're just like a zombie towards the end of the day. And I just knew, even though it might be, I guess, a little bit more convenient for some people, I didn't want to do it. And so I'll come in on Saturdays sometimes. I'm willing to do that for patients who might not be able to make these normal hours. But I just wanted to set it that way from the get-go. And by opening a little bit earlier on Fridays, I can make time for some patients who might not want to miss work. And also, I feel like a lot of patients also cancel on a Friday afternoon. So by ending a little bit earlier, we try to avoid that. Gotcha. What are the demographics in Irvine where you're at? Like, how'd you figure out the demographics? And then how are you like putting that with your marketing and everything like that? It's tricky. There are a lot of different demographics in this area. So first of all, I would say Irvine itself is very upper middle class or affluent in some different parts of it. Very safe community. But then there's also a really large immigrant community too. Heavily, uh, I would say like Chinese. And then there's also a large Arab population. So one of the things that I was looking for originally when I was trying to find, you know, a team is maybe someone who also spoke a little bit of Mandarin, which also that ended up proving to be a little bit more difficult than I thought. I didn't really get a lot of people who applied who spoke it. But there's also Newport Beach Close Five, which is a little bit older, also very affluent. And so... I guess when I'm running different ads, I'm trying to attract a lot of general patients from this immediate area, but then for more higher end cases, heavily focusing it on South County, Laguna Niguel, and then also Newport Beach too. What have you seen difficulty wise when it comes to working with those type of patients like from Laguna, from Newport, or maybe marketing to them when they call and ask you questions? And I think we're like, oh my, how many years have you been practicing? Oh. You know what I mean? Or- it's hard and I need to not let that get to me, but it's like a huge pet peeve of mine. I'll walk into a room sometimes and they'll be like, oh, how old are you? And I'm just like, <laughs> I did just turn 30 this year. So I, I definitely am on the young side. I get it. But no, I was going to say that's probably the number one issue I have when I'm first meeting someone. Obviously, when I get to know it, it's not so much of a problem then. But yeah. How are you combating that? I learned this in being in my last practice also. You never want to get defensive because when a person says that, they're just testing you. They want to see what your reaction is. So if you get defensive, it shows that they're winning. You just have to laugh it off. Yeah. In a very professional, polite way. Yeah. Not like an evil laugh, just like a professional laugh. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So then what systems would you say are unique in your practice right now that you're like, you know what, man, I'm proud of this that we've created. Probably my overall new patient experience. I want this to be a place where a patient walks in and they're immediately telling a lot of their friends and family about what a cool experience it was. So, you know, when a patient first sits down and maybe they're filling out some forms, I have like Katie, go ahead and grab them an espresso. We had sparkling water, some other cool beverages, and then she'll bring that over. We'll give them like a personal tour of the office too. I I feel like that builds value in showing what we do, what makes us different before they actually sit down in the chair. I also, through the company who did my branding, got these off of Alibaba, but they're like these little like travel kits that have our logo on them, a bamboo toothbrush with the logo on them, and then also these cool custom flosses. They get to take this home. Then towards the end of the new patient experience with Oryx, you're also able to give the patient a personalized handout showing them what their different risk levels for different things are. There's explanations for different conditions and they really, really like that educational value. Gotcha. So how do you utilize Oryx then for your new patient visitation, right? You said? I utilize Oryx for everything. It's our practice software, but they have a lot of really cool features that 
a lot of other softwares out there don't have. And that's what attracts me to them. Were you deciding between Oryx and another uh, thing? Or? I was looking at Curve also. I was wanting something cloud-based, you know, to where you could access it from anywhere. I have to diss on a lot of other softwares out there, but I also, since I'm building like a brand new modern office, I don't want a software that looks like Microsoft 95. <laughs> So <laughs> <laughs> I get you, man. I get you. So you felt like Oryx checked that part out, right? Uh, I mean, yeah, but that's to a service level. But yeah. I haven't taken any Koi's courses yet. I'm taking my first one in May of next year. But I've heard amazing things about Koi's. And I like how systematized Oryx is when it comes to doing that new patient exam. So you're doing the exact same thing with every patient. Because in dentistry, we get so distracted with so many little things. And so there's, we'll do something for no rhyme or reason. And it can influence the standardization of how you conduct that new exam. So by keeping you on task, you're always able to put together a nice comprehensive treatment plan for the patient. I know I'm going to ask you an excruciating detail right now, but like, how do they do that in the sense of walk me through like a new patient exam with huh. Oryx? It's like super patient guided. I don't even know how to describe it. Like the software itself guides you throughout your journey with the patient. So say a patient books online with you. Again, through Oryx, they give you a plugin to put on their website. You're going to get a pop-up. When you get the pop-up, you're going to be able to send the patient all of their forms and information that they need. And then when that's done, that patient is going to have their appointment time ready to go. And you're going to have a pre-checklist of everything the patient should have done or will need to do before you bring them back. You know, you can easily see that in the corner there. You'll get them seated in the chair on their appointment day. And then Oryx has a section just for clinical. Mm -hmm. And so what happens there is you have your radiograph section, TMJ section, you have an oral cancer screening section, you have a tooth morphology section, you have your probing and perio section, and then something like the appearance of the patient's teeth. And so you follow each one of those steps throughout every exam. And then that way you're hitting every box that needs to happen. And so by having conversations with the patient regarding aesthetics, the appearance of their teeth, they might talk themselves into doing something that they didn't originally plan on coming in for. Mm -hmm. And you present it that way or? So what I do is obviously I kind of discuss what I'm seeing, but I like to compartmentalize everything into four different sections. So I'll talk about the patient's overall smile. That's the first thing that I'll talk about the patient's gum and supporting bone. I'll talk about their bite. And then I'll also talk about the overall condition of each individual tooth. And I make my own PowerPoint presentation based on the photos that I took and the findings that I'm seeing. And then we look at them together on a TV that I have in my consultation room. Gotcha, man. So Oryx kind of helps you out with all that. Very much so. Nice, man. Okay. And that's like just one little yeah, picture, I, right? I will say Oryx's forms are long. I've been told by a lot of patients, hey, this is taking me a long time. I'm just like, just fill it out, please. But yeah. it really gets them thinking about different conditions that they're having. And I love how it allows me to ask open-ended questions about what they've been experiencing. Questions regarding food getting caught in between their teeth. By bringing that into the conversation so early, it makes talking about why they might need a new crown further on easier. Nice, man. By any yeah. chance, have you already reached 200 active patients or no? No, not there yet. I'd have to check. I want to say that we're like at maybe 60 to 70, something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is it free for you right now or no? I need to double check. I have like a free period. I don't know if it's free currently, but I also have a couple of friends who are going through the startup journey right now. So they put me as their referral. So I've gotten a couple of free months. Okay, nice, nice. I know like right now they're doing that. It's free until you reach 200 active patients. So that's what I was wondering. Bring it up to them and be like, hey man, Michael said it's free. But awesome, man. So then how many new patients are you getting monthly? It depends. I think last month we saw close to 20 new patients. And just because we are a little bit more of a cosmetically oriented office, I will get patients who come in here sometimes who are not looking to have me as a general dentist. They are only wanting to have maybe a little bit of veneer work done. They might also just want to do clear aligners with me. They're going to just stick at their other general dentist. And that's fine. Obviously, I ask them if they're looking for someone new. But even though it's around 20, sometimes that full number is not exactly patients who are going to be coming back consistently. Yeah, because if you look at your social media, right, it's nice. So it yeah. doesn't really look like a general practice. You know what I mean? To me, it kind of looks like uh, he's doing something elevated here. Well, thank you. And I mean, I will say, like, I was talking to my assistant, Jeff, about this. I am going to try to at least just add a little bit more content showing things maybe aren't as stiff as they appear. Maybe on Instagram, I want to make myself a little bit more, I guess, like approachable. 
and then also show more general dentistry type stuff rather than only cosmetic. I don't want people to get confused and think that we're only doing veneers or bonding at this office. But Connor, let me ask you, would you want to just do that? Only do cosmetic work? Yeah, like in the end where you're like, that'd be the goal if I can just do that. Absolutely. Yeah, that's my, completely my end goal. I'm young. I still have a, a large portfolio to develop before I am only seeing that kind of patient consistently. Yeah, it's different what you're doing. So it's attracting. I think when they get there, they're like, oh, you also do? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> that's my thought. But I don't know. It's up to you. I know right now, like you said, you're young and you want to build your portfolio. So what are you doing for marketing and advertising? A loaded question. Um, so I first started off, I found a company through a friend and some of the things that they were suggesting, I just really didn't like at all. And I ended up firing before I even used them really at all. And then I found someone who did some freelance stuff and basically running a lot of digital ads. Talked vision with her, but the office opened and I realized that I was having to constantly remind her to do different things. She was also in charge of my social media at the time too. So I'm just like, why wasn't this posted? We talked about this or what happened to tagging these different accounts with this. And so I realized since I was basically having to double check and do everything else myself at that point, why am I feeding her? And on top of that too, a lot of the search terms that she was using didn't make any sense at all. There were no exclusions for different things that were being done. For example, like I don't do full mouth implants in this office. I had a ton of people looking for cheap full mouth implants for seniors. So a lot of those terms should have been excluded from the get-go. And then while I was doing that, you know, obviously I looked into some drug marketing, trying to contact like different apartments to put my information, maybe in new resident flyers, that sort of a thing. But bringing it up to today, I worked with my cousin. He's a good Jeff Ball Trace guy. He helped me run some Google ads after I let that last freelance person go. Had a little bit of success with that. I've had a lot of success with direct mailers that my cousin and I did. But I also just brought in a new marketing company. They seem to be doing a good job so far. I really like their philosophy and different things that they suggested for me. And so we'll see how that works out. Got you, man. Okay. So direct mailers is it right now. I would have never thought that. I've had a lot of people say that they don't work at all, but I released my first round of them in early July, and I think I got at least 10 to 15 patients out of it. What'd you put on it? It was a picture of me, the office. We had a couple incentives on it, but I tried to use a slightly thicker paper when I was sending it out, and I just wanted it to have like a little bit of pop to it. So I made sure that the colors, everything that I did on it was very on brand. What was the incentives? And then what were the colors? My brand colors are like a, it's almost like a navy blue, a gold, and a cream. Incorporated those, but then the incentives were a new patient special, a free veneer consultation, and then also a discount on your design. Thinking about it now though, obviously I've already sent these first two rounds out. I would probably change the way that I do incentives. I would probably offer something that I would give a patient after they pay full price rather than offering an incentive itself right off the bat. Because sometimes when you send that out, patients are always looking for a discount to some degree. Hey, like if you come in, we'll give you the cool whitening pen. I think that's like a better way to do a lot of those incentives rather than saying, oh, hey, we're gonna completely discount your services. Because when I thought about it more so, I'm just like, am I potentially also cheapening my brand by doing this? But sometimes you have to do what you have to do in order to get people in the chair at the beginning. Could I ask what were the type of patients that came in from the mailers? And then what was the incentive that people were like, this is the one I want? I've had people come in for all three categories from completely different walks of life. I will say that the usual veneer consultation people tend to skew older. That's why I decided I want to target more so like Newport Beach, those type of areas, because I tended to grab the attention of older, maybe 60 to 70 year olds in those areas wanting to come in for that kind of stuff. Invisalign discount has brought in more young people. For a lot of people out there who are maybe thinking about adding that to a mailer, I would probably get rid of it because you have a lot of people who are just price shopping. And even though you say that it's gonna be X amount off, they still have an unrealistic expectation as to what the final price is gonna be. But I still wouldn't put that final price on your mailer. And then I've gotten a lot of people also just wanting to do the new patient special. How much do you charge for the new patient special? So right now it's heavily discounted for x-rays and exam itself. It's like around 150. That's good, man. Okay. So then mailers are, is what's working, bringing the best ROI yeah. right now. So hopefully now with some more different meta ads, I have this marketing company now working on doing a really nice job with Google ads. Also, we'll see some more people come in from that. And they even run like some ads on YouTube. And I actually got a patient through YouTube last week. Really? 
Yeah, I'm just, I would have never expected that. What's the ad on YouTube? I've been hearing that a little bit more from people. They're like, oh yeah, YouTube is getting kind of... So I think beyond people just watching YouTube videos or like channels, a lot of people use YouTube for TV itself, like cable. Your ads can sometimes be put on people's TVs in the same way that you would see 10 years ago, like a medication ad. Yeah. What is the ad that you have on there though? To be honest, I have no idea which one I should know. So I just had a meeting with them this morning. I forget which one that they chose, but. <laughs> yeah. Gosh, okay. I was just wondering if it has like an incentive. None of the ones that they're running right now have incentives on it. Oh, nice. That's good. Then. And then right now, what would you say from the moment you thought, hey, I'm going to do this to right now today, what's been your biggest or some of your biggest fails, pitfalls, or struggles? I think it's just keeping my expectations in check. I've always been the type of guy where if I worked hard, I would get what I wanted. You know what I mean? Like say I studied really hard, I would get a good grade. This is not like that. No matter how hard I try, getting patients through the door is not easy. It's been an interesting year. Like first dealing with personal problems with my parents, long distance relationship, getting this office open. There's been like a million and one things that have kind of happened. And so now adding on the stress of all this monthly debt service, and making it all happen, it's tough. And not only that, because you're a business owner too, you have employees under you, you want to make sure that you're able to take care of them too, because they're relying on you for themselves. Yeah. And it is tough. So how is this all affecting your personal life? Definitely was an adjustment. I was never really an anxious person before this year, but now as you're getting close to opening, you're trying to put out so many holes. There's always such a long reminder list. And I think it's so important that you do stay organized or else you're going to always be short circuiting or like a pinball machine trying to figure out exactly what you forgot to do. Because I am in a long distance relationship, even though it's like harder, it would be nice to have like support that's like a little bit closer, like a lot of people go through when they're opening up an office like this. It's actually worked to my benefit, I would say to some degree, because I've been able to devote more of my own personal time into this. So if you know what I'm asking, the long distance relationship is how long? East coast of Canada. Oh man. Yeah. That's kind of. As far. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's, it's not sucks. easy. Three hour difference? Four. Four? Yeah. He's in Halifax, Nova Scotia. So. <laughs> so then from that, right, the personal life, all this happening, how do you stay organized? One of the biggest things that I do is every week I have a project board that I work on with my team. And so we'll have the issue that we're having, what we're going to do about it, and then a regrouping date for when I want to have resolution for it, whether it's ordering a supply, making sure we have all the food ready to go for our open house. It just keeps everyone really accountable. And then for me personally, Apple Notes and the Apple Reminders app, I have a nice laundry list of everything organized by when I need to have a certain thing done. And I'm constantly looking at it and making sure that I'm just trying to take as many as I can when I get home each day. It's like a to-do list, like a checklist kind of thing. Exactly. A a nice little to-do list. Things are a little bit more stable now that I've been open three months. But if you don't have one of those when you're close to opening or right in your first month, I don't understand how you survive. Yeah, no, definitely. And you mentioned you had two consultants, right? I have one consultant. I brought her aboard in May. Her name is Patty. She's been fantastic. And we're starting to get more so into the operation side of things and then analyze the reports, making sure that all of our metrics are clearly put into the system. But in the beginning, she was fantastic with getting Katie trained up, making sure that we have a call strip that we're following, the new patient experience, how we're bringing patients in, how we're talking to them on the phone. Again, it's just that high level that we want to basically provide in this practice here. Gotcha. Okay. So that's like a mentor, right? I guess you can say. She really is like a mentor. Yeah. She's been super, super helpful with everything. Yeah. Awesome, man. So then one of the last questions I want to ask you is, say we're one of your patients coming in and we walk out and I'm talking to my friend and I just went to the my dentist. He is or they are. What do you want them to start saying about you or your practice? I really want them to say that it was like no office that I've been to before. It was very comfortable. It didn't feel scary. And they really went above and beyond to make me feel special. I don't want a patient to feel like they're just a number in here or that again, I'm like quartering them in a room, trying to get them to sign off on a care credit statement just to try to force them into treatment immediately. I want them to feel that they got educational value out of things and received personalized care. Received personalized care. They didn't pressure me. Uh Uh-huh. Anything about like the style or anything like that or no? That's probably the first thing that a lot of people comment on when they come in here. Um, You know, we tried to make the interior of this place look like a hipster boutique New York hotel. 
Greg from DesignWise, my designer, he did a fantastic job with the artwork, furniture, flooring. And so always, yeah, I want a patient to be like, wow, this is like nothing I've ever seen. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's becoming like that, man. It looks nice. Thank you so much. So like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Awesome, Connor. Awesome. We appreciate your time, man. Thank you so much for being a part of the podcast. We really appreciate it. If anybody wants to reach out to you, where can they find you? I think easiest is via Instagram. My business account is the dot tooth. Just reach me there and I'm usually pretty quick with getting back to uh, direct messages. Awesome. So that's going to be in the show notes below. And thank you for being with us. It's been a pleasure and we'll hear from you soon. Michael, thank you so much. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode. I really appreciate it. If you want to reach out to Connor, then please go in the show notes below, click on his links and reach out to him there. Go check out his Instagram. It's growing. He's doing amazing things. I believe he just had a grand opening. So go check it out. Pick his brain on that. Now, let's get real for a moment. Managing a dental practice is like juggling flaming torches while riding a unicycle. Sometimes it feels like that. You got appointments to schedule, patient records to secure, billing to manage, and let's not even get started on inventory and all that other stuff, right? It's a lot. But what if I told you there's a way to make all of that easier? I'm talking about Oryx, the all-in-one dental practice management software that's like having a virtual practice manager working around the clock. No breaks, no holidays, just efficiency. First off, Oryx streamlines your appointments. So say goodbye to double bookings and those scheduling nightmares that keep you up at night. With Oryx, you can manage your calendar with ease, ensuring that you and your patients are always on the same page. That frees up time for your front office. And now let's talk security. In this digital age, protecting patient data is more crucial than ever. And Oryx comes with top-notch security features that ensures your patient records are as secure as Fort Knox. Is that peace of mind? Yes, it is. And let's not forget about analytics. Oryx provides real-time data that helps you make informed decisions for your practice that move the needle toward growth. Whether it's patient satisfaction or financial metrics, you've got the insights you need at your fingertips. And the best part, Oryx is always evolving. They're committed to staying ahead of the curve, adding new features that make your life easier. And get this, Oryx is free. Click the first link in the show notes below and schedule a free personalized demo. Check out this limited time offer. Oryx won't charge you a penny until you've reached 200 active patients. That means it's free. Oryx is free until they know you are succeeding. But first, go check them out. Click the first link in the show notes below to schedule your free demo. And if you're still juggling multiple outdated softwares, it's time to step into the future. It's time for Oryx. So thank you so much for tuning in, and I'll talk to you in the next episode.